I'm Jayashree Pandya, founder of Cybersecurity Risk Research Center at Risk Group. I'm also the author of the book, The Global Age, NGIOA at Risk, where NGIOA stands for nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia. Technological innovation has always been the backbone of economic expansion across nations. From flying shuttles to the spinning journey, the electric motor to the diesel engine, and in recent times, the internet, has fundamentally transformed the world and changed society while ramping up the economic engine. We are probably heading towards a similarly disruptive time brought on by the big data revolution. To discuss this emerging revolution and its tactical as well as strategic global impact, along with the opportunities and risk, I'm delighted to welcome our guest of this week, Rishi Bhatnagar. Rishi is the founding president of Analytics and Big Data Society, an initiative of businesses and University of North Carolina. Welcome, Rishi. We are honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Hey, Jay Shree. Thanks for having me. Now, before we begin, Rishi, let's talk about your background and current efforts and initiatives towards big, big analytics. What attracted you to analytics and big data initiatives? Uh, you know, my background is banking and finance. Uh, in my first uh, consulting business, I did a lot of work around learning and forecasting. And uh, uh, typically in finance organizations, forecasting is interesting, meaning at $10 each, it will be $1,000. Now, real life, is, you could sell different units, your price could be, and uh, so, so I was one of the people who were probabilistic forecasting, sort of deterministic forecasting, meaning applying confidence intervals and applying models to uh, to forecast not only a right that pushed us into doing uh, modeling work and this was way back in 2008 in 2009 uh, around comes 2011 2012 and suddenly everybody's talking about big, about big data and analytics and predictive modeling and we were like wow we've been doing this for years now so uh, it's very much in, 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 in our ballpark what we do in this space or what we had done. Uh, so that kind of led to the second generation of second iteration of what we do. Everything around data, everything around um, analytics, and everything around, uh, around um, that technologies particularly you know. Oh, that's very interesting, Rishi. So how did you prepare yourself to the complex requirements and challenges of big data analytics? So my background has uh, uh, and um, in banking. So how did I transition in the space? I'll tell you the key to our side really is that uh, on the on my uh, on my daily job, which is uh, running Microsoft, we approach we approach business problems we try to solve business problems we talk about we do not lead the same technology be subservient to business needs and uh, so long as you understand what is the this easy technology this the challenge really is in framing the question the question frame the problem right done that the technology side of it is really easy. Oh, I see. Very interesting. So what do you think, Rishi, is your biggest takeaway from your years of effort towards analytics, data initiatives, statistic, and data-driven prediction? So um, I think my takeaway really is, uh, is I think data scientists, need, it's a huge responsibility uh, for some of the folks who really understand the software be able to demand the value of, of the real data science. If uh, communicate and provide value to their customers or their internal customers or external customers, uh, people would, would that you know data science probably doesn't give you a um, commensurate result. It's an expensive process. Do we did we get the results or not? So it's almost imperative that all practitioners uh, really focus on saying how can we, um, you, you know, when the rubber meets the road, 
we really need to be able to deliver some quantifiable benefits to the customer. And that's my biggest takeaway. It's really not about technology. It's really it's not about how many data scientists you employ. It really is about how many you all. And did you uh, quantify how you use the proposition? Right, right. No, it's it's a very good point, Rishi. So, what, if if I may ask, what is it that one thing you would like to change about how big data analysis is viewed and addressed today? I think I'm losing your game. Part of the okay. Uh, I, I, let me repeat. What is that one thing you would like to change about how big data analysis is viewed and addressed today? Because you 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 must be seeing how the industry operates and how uh, the data science is you know perceived by a lot of people. What do you think you would like to change? You know, in how the data analysis is viewed and uh, perceived today, or addressed today. Absolutely, and I think I, I'm going to sound a little bit. It does come down to. Um, Problem, framing the problem, quantitative results. This is what we're expecting. And, uh, let's go figure something out. Sometimes you may, you will hit that kit, or sometimes you'll exceed that target. Sometimes you'll fall flat. You'll not get what you want. But this is critical. So hard for businesses to get involved. A business owners and business users, salespeople, marketing people, supply chain people, to get directly in. Not just, just not just leading to the business to get the results and answer. No, that and that's definitely a good point. Uh, to and yes, complexity of technology. Right, 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 Rishi. So now, for the sake of you know people who have no idea what big data analysis is or how what is big data. How, let me ask you this fundamental question for their help and understanding is that how do we define big data? That's a great question. I, I think uh, big data, the, the whole concept of big data really came largely around uh, from internet scale and the, the four Vs, you know, the volume variety, et cetera, of, of big data. Those are the key characteristics of big data is, uh, but really getting results to be dependent on big data absolutely not if you go back in history you know seminal discoveries were made with the small data sets i mean really really small data sets um uh semmelweis dr semmelweis who came up with the concept of germ theory uh he, he, he was working in, a, in, a, in a, the hospital and he realized that uh patients for dying mothers who came to the hospital for birthing had a much higher um uh, uh, rate of uh, you know of dying because of, of birth than mothers who were actually giving birth out on the street. So for him, and he started analyzing that, and what he realized was was uh, there's this there are these things called germs which exist in cadavers. So at that time in 1840s, the doctors were going outside the, the hospital and and uh, practicing on cadavers and coming inside the hospital without washing their hands, without taking any predict, uh, protective measures and delivering a baby. So infection is, is what was uh, happening. And nobody knew that there are things called germs that could actually infect. And that Dr. Samuel-Wise came up with this germ theory based on a data set of about 1,800 patients. He didn't have big data, but he knew the problem that he was solving. And there's many examples like that. So big data is valuable, but big data um, or small data, if you can frame your problem well, it will help, it, uh, you know, you can get answers. All big data is gonna do, or larger volumes, larger data sets gonna do is get you more accurate results. It'll help you, like in case of security, right? Uh, just analyzing your internal uh, data logs is not enough to identify where the internal threat is coming from. You may want to, you may want to to peek into the social media activities of some of the people to understand who are these people at risk. Uh, you may have to go out and look at other factors, other data points. Single of it is that you have a broader uh, 
canvas of, of data that you can pull, pull from and, uh, and, and use that to get answers. Data in and data outside the four walls of your company. Oh, how interesting. Very interesting. Very good information, uh, Rishi. So uh, how does the industry collect big data right now? I, I'm sure it's all through the activities on the cyberspace, but what are they looking at? What kind? Where are they looking for information? Um, so data is happening everywhere, particularly if you, if you think in the Internet of uh, Things, IoT space. There's a lot of data that is being generated. Uh, so there's one side of it is data that's being generated. Second side of it is how much of that data do you want to capture and and store? Uh, that is going to be used all the time. All of the data may be used some of the time, but really not all of the data will be used all of the time. So having said that, a uh, question comes, how do you identify what data is good, what data is relevant? And that's what your models will tell you, what kind of models you want to build and you want to track. Folks are, the technologies, the other, the key factor of this, there's some good technologies today that will enable quicker, cheaper, don't uh, have no hesitation in capturing and, and recording and saving that data, right? So memory is cheap, storage is cheap, processing is cheap. So people can capture that data and store. And uh, companies are looking at data from not only their transactional systems, but also uh, you know every website visit, even if it's a non-internet business. Insurance companies do that a lot. Everybody who's coming to the website banks do that a lot. They track all of that information. They probably were not tracking that information the, uh, several years ago or ten years ago. Then uh, companies buy a lot of external data. Right, so insurance companies uh, spend a lot of money on bu buying third-party data. It could be credit data, it could be behavior data, it could be uh, credit card data, usage data. So um, companies are finding non-traditional sources of data. Healthcare companies, providers, and as well as payers are doing that. They're going out and uh, buying credit card data from MasterCard and from Visa and um, trying to tie the health and predict what the health outcomes could be and how do they improve uh, the, the, the health outcome for their patients and also keep the costs low. Right, now, but these, these is the data uh, that is available uh, based on the, you know, in the countries especially where uh, all these uh, connectivities there, internet uh, people are mostly, you know, connected. But there are nations where there is very little connectivity right, right now, and not everyone is connected. So is there any initiative or effort in uh, getting the data in some other, like you say, you know, non-traditional ways? Or one is credit card information, it is understood. Healthcare data is understood. But what if those the, there are nations where credit cards are not widely used? How do we collect data from those nations? Or for those communities, right? Um, so, so, so the factor that plays in uh, in, in countries, uh, uh, so, so, not not taking name of a country, but in a country where there are, are very few uh, smartphone users, there are very few computers, there are very few electronic point of sale systems. Uh, and, and start capturing the data where the size of the economy itself is so low that ties that data well enough. So that's one side. But then there are countries such as India and, and China where there is not such a deep penetration of, um, of the traditional internet or wired internet. So mobile devices are, are a huge um, factor. Even in Africa, uh, folks are using uh, mobile phones to make payments. In India, it's a big uh, trend. And mobile devices capture uh, some scary amount of data. Uh, the location data, the transaction data, the, 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 the temperature around you, uh, all of that information is captured by, uh, by these mobile devices. And all of that information is available to, to app makers. And with Google Watch, um, 
you know, yes. If, yes. Now, if they uh, wanted to know your heartbeat uh, 24 seven. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, now, this raw crude data that we collect in all these different uh, traditional, non-traditional ways, it is of no value unless we have tools that can help make sense of that data. So where are we in terms of tools, technologies, processes, and resources to achieve actionable data intelligence that would help any entity within any NGIO, that means nations, is government, industries, organizations, and academia? That, that's a great question. So, so raw data itself is, um, uh, is is not valuable. So if you talk about a specific uh, say use case, you know, if you're talking about um, um, money laundering or cross-border financial transactions or things related to terrorism, yes, there's uh, you need to collect a lot, lot, lots of raw data, and then you to see through that data, and that's you know the whole NSA conversation is about that that uh, if they had to err, they had to err on the side of collecting large data and mm -hmm. then and then seeking through it. Uh, so approximation is a better way rather than enumeration there in, in that case to say, hey, let's go ground up and first find out the people who, who we will track. That's difficult. That's the whole problem they were trying to circumvent and say, uh, we don't know who to track and therefore we need to look at this uh, this humongous amount of data to find out who are the people that we need to track. And, and, and that's some of the things uh, that, you know, NGIOs will have to start working on. And, uh, you know, in India, there's a lot of initiative around that as well, conversation about how, how much of data can the telecom companies store and how much of that can be shared with the government. So it's certainly a conversation that's, uh, uh, that's alive and kicking, uh, particularly in your, your, your world. Yeah. No, glad to know that. Now, uh, also, Rishi, as we know that data science is a rapidly growing field, and many big data analysts come from statistics, engineering, and computer science disciplines. Yes. While they are brilliant analysts, and they have the technical abilities that uh, the discipline requires, they are not trained to think strategically or look at the big picture. So how does the industry address this fundamental problem? Yeah, sometimes sometimes I would say that classical training is is, is can be can be a deterrent. Uh, a good uh, friend of mine ran the analytics team for Obama for America, uh, twenty twelve. In a uh, you know the team, there were two uh, two poker players in that team. They didn't know whole, a lot about uh, data. They didn't know a lot about it. Analysis. There were several psychologists on those on that team, but what these people did was collectively they were able to bring their own skills and build a solution, build a build an approach to go out and target the right uh, right people. So that's an example that um, you don't always necessarily need classically trained statisticians to be on the team. And it's not that only those guys will make the best data scientists. They are, they understand the statistic side of it, but you have to play in the, the human behavior of it, the psychology of it. And if you're trying to find out who is the best candidate for this type of credit card, um, data can tell you some uh, something, but how, you, how do you frame that, frame that problem in, in the context of who will actually buy? How do you define the persona of your buyer? And that's where you're going to need people who understand psychology or people who understand sociology. Yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, now, to manage cyberspace and its security challenges, one needs not only strong numerical and strategic thinking skills and capabilities, but also very in-depth industry knowledge uh, to uncover hidden solutions to not only business challenges, but industry, national, and global challenges. So how is big data analytics preparing to secure the cyberspace with real-time data intelligence that can help you know, address the bigger challenges that uh, industries, nations, and uh, everyone is facing across nations? That's a... That, that's a pretty deep question, uh, Jayashree. So if I have to break it down, um, you know, let's break that, I think, uh, the question into uh, two 
two or three parts. Would you would you mind repeating? So we'll try and break break that question down in two parts. One was the strategic and tactical thinking. That's one yes. side of it. Would you mind repeating the question? So, yeah. Sorry, I, I so, couldn't so hear we'll you. The question. So we'll break it down into two parts. So. Okay. So, one is okay. that uh, while we have addressed this, that it's not only the technical. Uh, skills that is required to you know uh, be in this big data field or you know to address this holistically but it also the strategic thinking uh, skills and capabilities that are necessary to be able to do justice to the big problems but also have very in-depth industry knowledge uh, to uncover hidden solutions to not only the challenges that are being faced by industry, but also by across nations and global, national and global challenges. So uh, the question is that, you know, how is big data analytics preparing to secure the cyberspace with real time data intelligence so that they can figure out a way how to address these bigger global challenges, national challenges, industry challenges? Absolutely. So to answer your first question, um, uh, Jeshi, about, you know, yes, you do need uh, uh, thinkers who, or in, in a team, you need people who have the strategic understanding of you know, or the understanding of the strategy, people who understand the technology side of it. So it's a team that you have to put together. You have to put together that team very carefully. Now, the second part of the question, how can big data and analytics help? Um, uh, you know, reduce hacking, reduce um, the, the cyber uh, security threats. Uh, I believe, um, I believe that <laughs> and analysis really our best weapon against it. Uh, and um, thinking that's going on in this is, is, I mean, fundamentally, it's like this. Fundamentally, uh, if if you just keep tracking somebody, for example, it, it's Sony. Uh, the people who hacked into Sony, uh, it's not like one fine uh, evening they decided to go and hack. They had been in their system for months and months and months. So how do you start identifying the outlier quickly enough, right? As soon as a, a smallest behavior um, that is outside the norm, how do you identify that? So uh, you have to understand, you have to get collect the data over several years, understand what is the behavior of this this data, and what are the outliers? If you do find some outliers, and you will, what you're going to do is you know, it's, uh, you're going to apply 80% of your resources towards those 20% of the outliers. The traditional um, uh, tools, which real time and all, you know, cracking off uh, everybody who's coming into the website, really what you're doing is you're applying 100% uh, of effort to 100% of the people who are coming. So you are giving same amount of time and energy and resources in tracking somebody who's coming in from, let's say, Houston downtown, comes in at the morning, 9 a.m., logs into your system at 9 a.m., logs out again every single day, and you're giving and risk, uh, risk assessment to somebody who's coming from outside the country, Asia, Pacific, Eastern uh, uh, Europe, somewhere. Uh, they come in at odd hours, they come into one server, they spend five minutes, they move to the next server, they spend three minutes, then they move to the next server and they stick around for two hours. That's an odd behavior. And how analytics and big data will help is to identify these guys who do not adhere to norm. And it's not always that you will have people coming from outside the country, there will be people inside your company who will be not adhering to norms. If they are not adhering to norms, uh, or the standard expected or predicted behavior, then you start tracking them. And that's the whole idea, how, how effectively you can track the people who are higher likelihood of doing damage uh, to your assets, knowingly or unknowingly. Yes, you are right. I, I get your point. But what, what, I, what I hear is that it's somebody, I mean, there must, there is a need for identifying teams uh, across entities, I mean, each entity probably will have to identify a team who will just sit there and think tactically, operationally, strategically that where would these challenges be coming from if we just talk about cybersecurity? 
that you know what kind of challenges in what form it could come and where what are the parameters that we need to look at the same goes for industries as well as the governments as well as the nations that they will have to have a defined uh, parameters and uh, there must there will there is a need for a group who would constantly you know if, think about you know what are the kind of challenges we would be facing where these challenges would be coming from that would probably help them define the parameters where they will probably need to look at the data Absolutely. so that uh, probably will be very helpful now while real time data is important it's also necessary as i just said to evaluate the not only the strategic data but also the historical data because all these not only real time data is important but the historical data as well as the uh, strategic data and uh, there needs to be an effort or initiative towards integrating all these three types of data that would give a very convincing picture about you know uh, what kind of challenges we are going to face or what kind of opportunities we can you know probably identify so are there any initiatives that can, that will look at all this integration of these three different kind of data i think uh jayesh absolutely point absolutely pointfully taken that you do need some central organization that has a uh, uh, charter to, to do something like that and they're going cross border and uh, in talking to people arranging organizing and consciously tracking uh, these uh, or working on an initiative like that absolutely and my feeling is is it not your group that's doing something like that aren't you involved in in, in initiatives well, like that i um uh, we uh, i am beginning to do something like that but uh, there is there are a lot of resources that one requires uh, no one single entity can do this uh, you know initiative or justice if they don't have enough resources or enough you know collaborations across industries and nation but that is something i mean i hear all this hype about big data analytics and uh everything and i i feel that you know unless we have a structured framework and unless, unless we have defined collaborations and you know every organization working together to create some you know huge intelligence that would be meaningful for any industry or any nation we need to have uh, such big you know efforts going on but it it is uh, in a very infant stage and i i there is a need for bigger collaboration that's what i would say at this point absolutely i think in that bigger collaboration um it, if it has been going on uh, in the intelligence community in a traditional sense but these uh, intelligence agencies need to start collaborating and working on the on on, on initiatives like this in in a very conscious manner this needs to be added to the charter uh and and both inside and outside of the formal uh intelligence community or governments yes governments yes. like governments so uh you know it's not like uh, what nsa is doing is uh, united united states is unique uh, most all countries have uh, similar initiatives we know about them and, and they talked about it so uh some of these initiatives are done for conscious you know for for uh, uh sane objectives and some of them are not for uh, such a good objective right um, you can't trust, trust all state actors uh to be doing this thing for the right uh, reasons so uh, is there a need for uh, for uh, states to get together and say let's go out and, and form a group outside of uh, the, the, the traditional intelligence communities and work on uh, on tracking the bad guys and uh, and state actors as well as non state actors absolutely well, i i think absolutely because rishi i mean if you look at the bigger global problems that we are facing for example you know there is a lot of effort uh, and uh, resources that have been uh, poured in eradicating poverty let's say you know for example but we don't see much results coming out of that i mean uh, millions and billions of dollars have been spent on eradicating poverty now why is there no you know or you know more visible results coming out of that we still see the challenges and struggles across you know many nations so we nations need to probably join hand and you know create a collaborative effort 
of collecting data that why is the investment that we are making in eradicating poverty is not bringing us some you know fruitful result what is it that is a challenge or an obstacle so those kind of bigger problems we can you know probably find answers to that this you know ability and capability to have this kind of collect ability to collect such big data and to analyze it and to have some very useful information that is so amazing and that is uh, such a revolutionary and uh, i think uh, a lot a lot of good can be done because of you know this uh, technological ability that we have i think technology will be able to provide a lot of answers to bigger problems that we have not been able to answer so far uh, you're right. I would go back to uh, LBJ when he came. Uh, he was in White House. He said that uh, he's going to er eradicate poverty. And from where LBJ uh, was in 1960s to where we are today, um, talk about where we are in terms of poverty. The global, uh, not only uh, globally, but also inside uh, inside United United States. Absolutely. My wife is involved in an initiative. Um, she's also very passionate about big data, but she's gotten involved uh, she, in an initiative that big data to reduce or eliminate um, uh, human trafficking. So very interesting. The, the, yeah, that's a great use case in uh, cybersecurity and uh, and. Uh, uh, and several initiatives are helpful for us as, as, as good business community and keep ourselves safe and good. But things beyond that, which will improve the life of uh, the average person and uh, us as a society, initiatives around reducing human trafficking, eliminating human trafficking uh, and um, uh, poverty. Absolutely, these can be used. I think big, big data and uh, will be able to provide tremendous value in that. Uh, we will be able to understand the root cause why such uh, activities still continue why is there still poverty why we are not able to abolish uh, trafficking uh, why are cer certain things you know like this still in spite of you know uh, making so much effort uh, so those answers big data analysis analysis uh, will be able to provide us such answers and i'm looking forward to seeing those answers that I, I, my goal is to look at the root cause of the problem. Why we are still struggling with, you know, so many bigger problems. We should be, I mean, the, with the amount of resources we are putting in, we should be able to uh, eradicate all those problems, but we have not been able to. So there is something else that is going on. And what is that something else? We will be able to define that. And we will be able to address that because of the capabilities of technology, like, you know, uh, big data analytics. So that is a very exciting uh, uh, time that we are in, that we have so much potential and we will be able to do so much more with the help of the technology. Now, having said that, let's uh, big data analytic tools and abilities are hope to provide nations the first line of defense in providing integrated security threat prediction, detection and prevention programs. Now, it is expected to provide better, faster, actionable security information that will reduce the critical time from detection to remediation, enabling cyber warfare specialists to proactively defend and protect the network. However, the reality of cybersecurity challenges puts a dent in the hope of security through big data. To be able to provide integrated security threat prediction, one needs integrated approach and framework uh, as we just talked before, that there needs to be a structured framework and a collaborative effort. Now, in the absence of any st such integrated structured framework, how does the big data industry collect integrated data? Because I read in so many places that the, we are collecting integrated data. How do they collect integrated data if there is no structured integrated effort going on? Where are they getting this data? And what is the uh, authenticity or integrity of that data? That's a great question. So, uh, you know, it all begins with uh, with having data and, and having the right raw data versus uh, cleansed and value added data. Uh, uh, your question is very valid. Um, I wish I knew that. Uh, you know, how people could collect uh, uh, the right data. I think. Um, I think. 
you know, just the thing that you've shown around it and the, and the kind of conversation we just have at last 10 minutes. Um, I clearly see the need of a more centralized uh, initiative, whether it is formally, you know, gov government funded or, or, or not, but I think there is a need for that and there's value proposition in that. And, uh, and funding should be possible for an initiative like that to say, how, how, how are these nations, uh, you know, even collaborating with data? Uh, forget about nations, you know, inside, inside, uh, inside your, our, our own state, uh, there's this open data initiative by governments. And uh, the city that I live in, the county that I live in, uh, you can't go to one place and get that data. When you go to the county uh, open data initiative, you get county data. When you go to city open data initiative, you get the city data, but not vice versa. So, you know, we're having challenges in collaborating data and centralizing the data and cleansing the data. The city and county level, at country level, can you imagine how big of a challenge is that history? Uh, so, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you repeat the last sentence? And therefore, it's important. I, I think it's a bad sentence. Can, can, yeah, can you repeat that sentence, please, Rishi? I said, you know, we have challenges in, in collaborating um, uh, on data at county and city level. So, you know, forget about collaborating data at country level. How, how, what kind of a huge challenge that would be? And it is. And therefore, the need for a, a central organization with a defined charter to work on cross-border data around whether it's cybersecurity or it's uh, human trafficking. And uh, we have to get the 100,000 foot picture of what's going on uh, globally to be able to solve localized problems. No, you are, you are right. We, there is a need for such an organization. Now, what will be that organization? Who will be its backers? How will it be formed? All that uh, we will have to wait and see in the coming years how that is structured. But uh, one thing I can say is that, yes, there is certainly a need for an organization like that who can have, uh, who has the authority to have a, you know, structured collaborative effort uh, across NGIOA. Uh, I mean, right now we are having struggles even working within one industry where you know all the entities within an industry also they are not collaborating so we have a huge challenge in front of us so it's going to require a lot of effort and a lot of support and backing but uh, there is uh, all we can uh, do is right now identify that these are the things that are necessary and uh, hopefully we will find the backing and hopefully we will find the right resources to be able to do that in the coming months and years so we'll just have to wait and see Rishi on that. Now, uh, let's go to talk a little bit about uh, the skill set that you know we talked uh, earlier. Uh, I think this uh, plays a very important role that while the familiarity and ability to use Java, Python, SQL, and uh, all these other technologies uh, and languages are core essentials, industry knowledge and expertise, as we talked before, is even more critical to make sense of the enormous data that is in front of any analyst. Now, how is the big data industry ad addressing the multiple skills requirement? Because as we talked before that, you know, ability to think strategically, ability to have an in-depth knowledge about the industry or the, you know, technical expertise, those are all very different skill sets. How is the industry trying to find people who, I mean, it's impossible to find a person that has all those skill sets. We will need to have probably a team that can have you know all these different skill sets because it's impossible to find all these skill sets in one person. So how is the industry handling this problem? That's a great question. So the two or three uh, uh, that I see uh, happening. One is you know first of all a quick parallel to history. Go back to 1990s, early years, uh, you know late 1980s, early 1990s. There were, gosh, there were. 80, 100, who knows how many ERP systems were there, the complex systems, difficult to implement, long cycles, high risk projects. You needed 40 people, three years to uh, put in a project and, and you didn't know if it's gonna be successful or not. So those were the learning years. I, I see the big data industry as, as uh, where the ERP industry was in early uh, 1990s or late 1980s. So, 
what's going to happen eventually, Jayashree, uh, out of this soft tool, so we'll gain, some of them will become more mature. And tools, several vendors try to work on tools and, and start more mature tools. Uh, that will make the life of a, of a data scientist easier. There will always remain some purists who will want to write their own models and absolutely, you may need situations where you have to write your own models, but some of the standardized statistical techniques will be available and they will be trustworthy. That's what SAS used to do. And that's what other companies such as Rapid Miner and Naim and R, there are several routines available, several models available that people can adopt. So there will be a convergence analytics side and the statistics side. Similarly, there will be a convergence uh, on the big data technology side. So those technologies will start narrowing down. They will mature. Hadoop technologies are still very, very dynamic. They're changing. But uh, I see in next uh, year, two years, three years, majority of that will start stabilizing. They will be, people will start trusting them. And then uh, the convergence of the data side of it uh, and the analytics side of it will happen. Yes, yes, you're right. Now, uh, there's also uh, another point that is, while data science is all about asking questions, that is mainly about asking questions, as we try to search for deep hidden patterns hidden within our data, it's also important to have many other skill set. Can you, this is mainly for, you know, students or professionals who are trying to enter uh, this industry. Uh, can you explain them what those skills are and what they should be working on? I'm losing you quite a bit, Jayshree. I okay, I, uh, I think probably the Wi-Fi connection or internet connection is uh, not proper there. Uh, it seems so. But what I was saying, Rishi, is can you hear me better now? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Uh, but it's slow, then, yeah, then it's better. Okay, sorry about that. My apologies, but there is something wrong in the transmission today. It's a little poor than uh, usual. But uh, anyway, uh, what I was asking Rishi is while data science is all about asking questions, as we try to search for deep hidden patterns, it is also important to have many other skills. And now, as we know that there are a lot of students and a lot of professionals who are getting excited about the potential and ability of big data analytics. And they are getting ready to join that industry and join those effort and initiatives. What would you tell them to that, you know, these are the other skills, you know, also you need to work on, you need to prepare. For example, uh, you know, business skills or uh, uh, domain knowledge or technology. What, what are those other areas that you would tell them to prepare for? Definitely business skills, definitely business skills. I would say um, a good consulting skills uh, are important. It's not like uh, you only consultants, if you have good consulting skills, you'll work with a consulting company, but consulting skills will help you talk and work effectively with your internal customers as well. Okay. As well. Work on those things, communications, I mean, asking questions, people uh, believe that we have to give answers. You know, we always have to have the right answer. I believe that it's more important to have the right question than have the right answer. Uh, you know, whether you're talking about something on the innovative world, you know, most of the innovations in the world have happened not because these innovators or these uh, uh, people, they had the answers. It happened because they asked the right questions. Right, whether it was uh, you know people discovering uh, magnetism and, uh, and and making getting the first concept of motors, was all yes. Yes. people are asking. So asking the right questions is absolutely the first skill that right. all students should develop. Right, and then having the curiosity, the desire, and uh, burning passion, probably that you know, yeah, you want to do, you want to make a difference. You want to solve big problems that you know the nations or industries or uh, the global community is facing. You know, so those, if you go with that burning desire, 
you, you will be able to do much better because you you will know where to look for the uh, you know answers or where to look for the data and where to look for the hidden patterns and things like that so now having said that why? sorry start with why and keep asking why keep yes asking why. Yeah. you are right you are right yes i start with the why you are right now what what do you think what are some interesting initiatives in big data going on currently across nations i mean if you have knowledge about other countries that would be great otherwise you know what are the great initiatives going on here in united states currently that would you know seem to be very interesting and that uh, we will look forward to you know seeing the progress in in those uh, initiatives i think uh, from a broader society perspective i uh, i'll be interested uh, i am interested in knowing what's going on in the healthcare side uh, that is something that impacts individually and it also impacts uh, the society uh, our, so can you tell us a little bit about your healthcare yes, initiative uh, that you are working on? Rishi, can you tell us a little more about the healthcare initiative that you have? Oh, some examples? Is it what you asked for, Jishri? Uh, yeah, I'm, it's, it's breaking on and off, but I'm able to understand. Yes, go on, please. In healthcare, both from population health and from the perspective of um, uh, identifying uh, to diseases or, or the things that you know people people lose their life to. Um, a lot of really interesting uh, initiatives going on there, and uh, my feeling is a lot of very unconventional results set will come up with like that. Um, you know, healthcare is one industry where we lose, you know, different numbers, but anywhere between 70 to 100,000 lives every year, just due to negligence or wrong diagnosis or wrong uh, administration of uh, medicines, medication. And that's a huge cost. Second time is uh, transportation and uh, a lot, lot of work needs to happen there, and IoT uh, is going to lead that space. You know, companies like Tesla and Volvo and these guys, they're doing some really interesting work in that space. But again, going back to what we were talking earlier, Jayshree, that uh, you know, just the way countries need to talk, just the way companies need to talk, we, we cannot build a safe traffic infrastructure without making one car talk to other other car. The car has to be intelligent, non not unto them. So cars have to be intelligent as, a, you know, all cars need to talk to each other. And, and that's when we'll talk, that's where we'll get to a really safe um, road and uh, Similarly on, uh, I think, cybersecurity, we do need strong collaboration and a lot of uh, user analytics in that space. Yes, no, that is good information, Rishi, and I think uh, that uh, would be a very interesting initiative to watch. Uh, now, big, many big data analytic initiatives focus on marketing. I mean, it start, Amazon started with that marketing uh, initiative. In, uh, that, that was an amazing journey that Amazon had with the big data analysis uh, about marketing. But analyzing big data can also help uh, NGIUA do other important functions that could help them do better or shorten time in what they are doing or be more productive, efficient, solve bigger problems, create new industries or open new markets, things like that. What do you think world should be prepared for? I think marketing uh, uh, analytics, uh, use of analytics and marketing space was uh, it's just incidental. One is a lot of low hanging fruits in that uh, space. Two is um, a lot of data was available, right? We're talking about uh, big data coming out of the internet scale companies. They had a lot of data. They were the first beneficiaries of the large data set. You know, no wonder Hadoop came out of uh, Yahoo and, and those companies. So, uh, that's where the place almost logical big data in, uh, in the um, art from 
but how it will propagate is propagating way beyond that. So I don't know Jayashi, if I answered your question or not. I think I answered the first part. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it is uh, probably too early to be able to say what kind of things uh, uh, the world needs to be prepared for, what uh, different uh, uh, openings that, you know, what new markets would open because of the big data industry or what uh, new industries will open or how we'll be able to do things better, uh, more, be more productive, be more efficient, be more... Uh, 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 be able to solve more problems, be able to handle bigger problems, things like that. I think probably it's too early to answer those questions. We'll just because there is not much intelligence out there that we can base our response on. Like you know, what are what is this group doing? What is that group doing? And what are their efforts? What how much they have succeeded? There is no not much collaborative intelligence that is out there. So it's probably hard to answer that question at this point, unless we have a structured effort where we will know that what kind of initiatives everyone is working on and uh, how far they have you know, gone in that and uh, how much success they have. So it's a little bit hard for at this point to answer that question. So I, I, I understand your point at that uh, uh, at this point, you know, what we can uh, how we can respond on that. But do you see, Rishi, that these big data analytics will replace traditional experience? Because so far over the centuries, you know, we have relied on experience that, OK, this person is really experienced. He has this many years of experience. And uh, let's hire him because that would be great to have you know, on our team. But do you think this big data analytics just uh, fundamentally changes that necessity? That's a, that's a loaded question. Are you waiting for the times when companies will become self-aware? Will become self-aware? <laughs> uh, I think experience uh, hugely underrated. Hugely underrated. Um, the companies that will purely rely on data and not juxtapose or not overly data with the experience will fail. Uh, this one, there's a classic example, I forget the name of the gentleman, he, he ran uh, the large casino chains uh, in, in Vegas, and he was offered to buy into, uh, into, into a large casino in uh, Macau, outside China. And he built all, all his models said, nope, it doesn't make sense investment. And, uh, and they did not make that decision. And this CEO has, is on record as saying, my models were wrong, my result that I got for data was wrong, and I made a huge mistake by not going to Macau. Because uh, Macau's total gaming revenue, just the gaming revenue in Vegas, larger than Vegas, several, several times larger. So companies purely rely on data and not uh, you know, fall into the folly of data would be would have challenges. There's several other examples like that. You know, or Oracle's America Cup uh, story is similar. So, uh, America Cup winners uh, is is a race uh, which is funded by Larry Ellison, and the boat was used latest and the greatest technologies uh, in everything imagined, and they had this onboard computers that would tell it what to do, and. and um, I think the story is about last year's race uh, that they lost out of the 17 or 18 races. They kept loss, uh, losing every single time because at some point the computer would say, do this. And uh, uh, the captain who actually comes also comes from, from a history uh, whose family of uh, sailors or generations, he said, you know what? My hunch tells me to do something else, but computer keeps telling me to do this. And uh, he said, well, now it's do or die situation. I cannot expect different results by doing the same thing over and over again. So he said, I'm not going to rely on what data is telling me, telling me, what computer is telling me. I'm going to override and I'm going to use my experience. And guess what? They won the race. They won races after races after races and they were, they were the winner. So there are examples where just using data uh, to make final decisions or be the only factor is not good. I would say that uh, data, data and, and what data tells 
should be supplement, should complement the decision making. It should be a, another data point on what you should. I, I can I can see your point in that because uh, I think at this point uh, there is no way to rely on the integrity or the authenticity of the data because there are a lot of uh, we don't know what kind of data we are going getting for our analysis because like you we talked in the earlier uh, uh, questions that you know uh, earlier discussions that uh, sometimes we have traditional sources we have sometimes you know uh, data coming from the cyberspace uh, we there are a lot of different sources of collecting the data and there is no way to know for sure whether the data that we are getting is you know authentic or whether there is you know integrity or there is some problem in that so yeah unless i i think you know the technology has the capability to reach the decisions based on the data they have but the, if the data that they we provide uh, for the analysis if there is a problem in that data then we are not going to get the right intelligence out of that and probably in those circumstances like you said that we will uh, the experience probably will override the intelligence that we collect from the uh, computers or big data analytics initiative so probably i think uh, there will still be need i think that's uh, the conclusion that we are reaching that there is still going to be need of that experience and wisdom and uh, that probably will uh, not be replaced probably for decades uh, right, that is right. that is going to be valid <laughs> Right, right. No, I understand that. So now, um, like everything else, big. I mean, we just talked about the integrity and authenticity of data, but like everything else, big data also has serious challenges. Like, you know, there are a lot of uh, people, you know, are raising the questions about privacy. They, and there, there's also, we have talked about the data, data security. I mean, because of the cyberspace is not secure right now. So there are also a uh, lot of questions about the security of the big data initiatives so, and uh, there are so those kind of questions are out there like you know people are not comfortable that you know the, everything they do every move they make what they eat what they uh, you know when they go to doctor when they go to movies what kind of friends they have everything is you know becoming visible and it's public knowledge there is no more privacy. So there are a lot of people not comfortable with that. So the privacy issues remain and the, uh, the security issues remain right now that, you know, all these big data initiatives are going on, but how secure they are because the cyberspace itself is not secure. So that also is a big another question. And then data integration, like we talked uh, uh, earlier that, you know, there is no structured effort, integrated effort on uh, these uh, big data, you know, initiatives. So, how do we deal with those challenges? No, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. I think uh, uh, there is concern, and the the concern will stay around uh, uh, for a long, long time. That the challenges around security of PII and keeping, you know, personally identifiable information. How do you keep any of that information secure and away from uh, uh, from uh, bad people, if you will, for lack of a better word? And uh, uh, are there initiatives? Can you always make something like this foolproof? Uh, it's impossible. I mean, the companies that went on record to to say that they had one of the most secure infrastructures and this is what they have done in security and this is what they have done. For example, Ashley Madison, right? Yes. They were, they were, uh, they were on record for for claiming that they have a very very secure website. What happened, right? And uh, so those situations will stay. I think humility is a, is a big big value, and people people should never underrate humility. And uh, it's only a matter of when uh, something like this could happen. Uh, there was somebody that commented right that. Uh, companies, companies that they have been hacked and companies who do not know that they have been hacked. And, uh, you know, once somebody gets in, uh, it's, it's difficult to, it's difficult to track. So, uh, 
and the whole initiative around, uh, around cybersecurity is very contextual to this conversation, it's very core to this conversation. Now, well, there is a hope that, you know, big data analytics will be able to bring solutions towards cybersecurity. It itself is facing cybersecurity threat right now. So, uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Right. The other side of it, though, is, uh, Jayshree, that how it's not only that we keep secure, but, uh, you know, for the, the corporate governance itself is, a, is an important factor, right? So, can Google keep your data secure? Yes. The question is, how does Google want to use that data with your knowledge, without your knowledge? And Google's one example. There are several other companies who are who have a lot less scrutiny. There are several other companies who have a lot less uh, 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 corporate governance around how to use uh, personal uh, that data, personally identified viable data and that information. And that's where the bigger challenge is. How do we, you know, as, as good corporate citizens, how do we? Yes, I hear you on that. No. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's uh, interesting analysis. Now, the market seems to be at a tipping point as big data move beyond the state of infancy and investments are pouring into the big data space for its impact and real value. So where do you see the investment going within big data? What, what are the different areas or different initiatives? Where do you see the investment, you know, uh, going heavily. Wherever there's money. Wherever there's money, okay. <laughs> and things that you and I know about or read about, Jay, are the tip of the iceberg. There are lots of things which are happening beyond that, that, uh, you know, where it is going. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> right. Now, data is growing at an exponential rate and creates both opportunities as well as risk, uh, as we have been talking uh, for the last few minutes. Where do you see the opportunities and where are the risks facing NGIA by the potential and ability to have real data intelligence today? Um, so, uh, Jesha, would you mind repeating the question one more time? Real sure. Where do you see the opportunities in the big data uh, uh, industry, emerging industry, and what are the risks? We just talked about few risks like privacy and security and all those uh, risks are there, but what are the other risks that you see uh, facing this industry? Um, uh, I think uh, there's some, some, some uh, I think industry could fall trip over itself. Uh, there's a lot of this conversation about uh, shortage of data science and universities are running courses on data sciences uh, uh, and people who attend these weekend courses over over three months start touting themselves as, as data scientists. That is uh, that is not right. That is true. Right. Right. You can't you can't make somebody a data science by attending a Saturday you know, four hours classes on Saturday and three months later they pick up. So we, we may be we may be diluting the value of what data can do. We may be overhyping the value of what of what data and analytics can do. And that would be, I think that's a more fundamental risk to the industry. Uh, and where all of this thing leads to is not showing results. If we continue to show results and value, absolutely. If we are not showing results, if we're not showing yes, we're not saving money making helping people more money if we can uh, stop uh, human trafficking and if we cannot uh, people we run the whole things over and over again i don't think that's a <laughs> that's a very good opinion. no i i hear you know that's very interesting analysis yes yes you know i i uh, hear you on that now we talked about human trafficking we talked about poverty uh, where, where else do you see big data that can help solve other critical challenges facing nations and society in general. I mean, we talked about two of these bigger problems like human trafficking or uh, poverty. Where, what other problems do you think we can solve using big data? At a little scale around nations, um, I think Jayashree, terrorism is, a, is an important thing that people need to worry about. And I think states worry about, states talk about. There's a lot of investment going in that space. And certainly combating terrorism is an important part. And uh, uh, that's where there's quite a bit of opportunity. And that's where our data, cross-border data 
data is very helpful. Uh, you know, almost the analogy is uh, is weather. So if if I have a little weather pane on top of my house, I'm going to know right around my house what's the weather like. But if I want to predict the weather uh, around um, around my my city, then I have to know what's going on uh, in the weather patterns um, two, 200 miles outside my city, right? Where is the storm system moving in? What are the winds like? What are the temperature around other parts of the neighbor neighboring um, geographies? But if I want to predict the weather at uh, at a U.S. level for the whole country, then I have to go way beyond my country and find out what are the uh, wind patterns, what, what are the temperature patterns. So very much like that in, in case of terrorism, we have to, if you have to find out what is the probability of the next terror attack in New York and what kind of terror attack could happen, or what kind of terror attack could happen in, in a, uh, around a U.S. embassy in Africa somewhere, you have to go way beyond collecting data just around people coming inside the U.S. and going outside the U.S. You have to that would data. be such an interesting, uh, you know, initiative. If somebody is working on that, and if they are able to identify all the parameters of the uh, getting that uh, criminal intelligence, when would the where would the criminal attack be happening, or you know, who will be responsible? would be behind that if those kind of that kind of information uh, big data analysis uh, can help uh, gather or identify that would be such a blessing and that would be such a huge uh, uh, benefit to the for the safety and security of the global community so uh, i hope that you know we succeed in that area because that is uh, something that uh, Every nation, every industry, everyone is, you know, worried about at this point, you know, terrorism and uh, criminal activities, irrespective of whether it's in cyberspace, geospace, or, you know, uh, anywhere else, whether, you know, what kind, where are we going to get that attack? What, who is going to uh, be doing the criminal activity? If we can identify that using big data analytics, that would be amazing. And I look forward to, you know, getting more information on that. Now, this is probably the last point we'll discuss is that out of this race of getting competitive intelligence, which nation is expected to lead and win the race from your perspective? <laughs> Oh my God! Oh my God! That's, that's very. Low. I, I certainly would love to see uh, uh, U, U.S. wins, and I think we have the right resources, the right talent, absolutely, by far, by far. But but what happens is, uh, for the bad actors, they have to get lucky just one time, and and, and the fear uh, uh, is a lot larger, right? Uh, it's a, it's a tough it's a tough question every single time we have to get lucky every single time in stopping the bad guys but the bad guys have to get lucky only once yeah yeah i hear your point yeah, I hear your point on that. Because see, for uh, bad actors or crim cyber criminals, for them to uh, have a cyber attack cost them very little. Whereas, you know, what we are defending is it's very complex to defend the infrastructure, the systems that we have built in the geospace. It requires a lot of resources. It requires a lot of investment, a lot of tools. So it's very complex to protect what we have. So yeah the, it it depends like a good and bad both hopefully you know uh, we can win in the good part that we can protect and we can find more opportunities because of the big data analytics to create more industries to create more markets and to create a better life for everyone a better productive efficient life Absolutely. so hopefully you know united states lead in that and we would uh, be thrilled to see that uh, progress and development and economic prosperity that comes with that. But you are right that, you know, we also have to keep an eye on the bad actors and uh, what uh, they are planning to do and uh, where they are going with their uh, uh, capabilities that they have and uh, desires they have to do damage. So hopefully, you know, before they cause more damage, we will be able to figure out, you know, where those uh, criminal minds are 
and we will be able to identify them and we'll be able to stop them so uh, with that uh, i think uh, let's conclude our discussion i mean we can probably talk about this for hours rishi and we i would love to have that discussion uh, some other time too uh, but i think uh, we have uh, re- come to the end of our allotted time so that's it for today friends for more information on risk roundup and the upcoming risk uh, dialogue please go to www.riskgroupllc.com thank you everyone and please join us again uh, thank you so thank much you. rishi thank you for your time it was a pleasure talking to you likewise thank you